Today, I'm thrilled to introduce a guest whose career is as diverse as it is impressive. Joining us is Ken Lever, an entrepreneur, strategist, and product leader who has worked at the intersection of technology, business, and innovation for over 20 years. Ken's journey has taken him across the globe, from strategy consulting to being a CEO, to leading product teams at high ground companies. He's also launched and scaled six startups of his own. So when it comes to understanding how to grow a business from the ground up, Ken is a seasoned expert. Currently, Ken runs Task Beasts, a company that builds plug and play freelancer systems for fast growing business, helping them scale efficiently. He also a co-founder of Revive, a direct to consumer brand focused on dental, biomechanics and health. Alongside this, he's acting as a fractional COO and head of tech for a venture funded solar startup, showcasing his ability to balance multiple high impact roles. Through his career, Ken has led strategic projects for big name companies like Ozone, Wazoko, and Circles Life, driving innovation and growth across various markets. Whether it's building tech teams, launching new products, or advising startups, Ken's approach is always about finding smart, scalable solutions. In today's episode, we will dive into Ken's entrepreneur journey, how he helps companies grow using freelancers, and his insights of navigating the ever-evolving tech landscape. I'm excited for all of you to hear his story. Please welcome Ken Lever. Hey, <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I enjoyed working with Nay 10 years ago, was always ref refreshed by your, you know, friendly, smiling outlook on everything. Happy to have reconnected like this. Thank you again, Ken, for accepting our invitation. Uh, appreciate your compliments. And let's roll the ball for the first thing that it comes up in mind. I would like to know, considering all of your experience and things that you know it had happened because you are actually a global professional, a global entrepreneur. And uh, I would like to know what has been your greatest struggle and how did you overcome it? So I would say the biggest struggle I've had from a long-term perspective was finding myself. I feel like the generation I came out of, I was Gen X, I, I graduated college in 1999. Every, we had it wired in our brain that we should, you know, go to a good school, work in consulting or banking, make good money, go back to business school, you know, go back into consulting and banking and make more money. And so that is how I kind of approached my life. Uh, during those golden years. And so my struggle has been that I don't think that that's what I really wanted. Um, and I like so much more being my own boss and starting new ideas and not like I'm a person that doesn't like dealing with politics. So I, I would say my struggle is that I spent so long kind of doing things that I think were not meant for what I wanted to be, but were rather kind of were ingrained in me. Uh, and, and it was a big struggle to just continue doing those things, even, you know, I enjoyed them. But um, finally, I think I realized what I consider my true path. Understand. And uh, this is something very interesting because as you said, it takes time and you need to pass through a lot of things also to find yourself in, which is very complicated. I mean, there are people out there that take usually the entire life to do so. Uh, we even have a clear example of some entrepreneurs that they actually get to success and do something really well at late ages. Yeah. I would like that to be me. You know, I've done, I've, I always did startups when I was younger on the side. So I would have a very busy job. You know, you, I spent seven years in strategy consulting and 
I did several startups on the side. You know, I was there when the first dot com bust. That I, I was, you know, I was a year out of college back then, and I had tried to do a, a dot com startup right before the bus stop, and then, and, you know, some years later, I tried another one. So, I feel like, you know, I, I w- it was always like something I would do on the side. Meanwhile, you know, I had this more serious career, which I don't think I was cut out for. Like. You know, I wasn't going to be the consulting partner. I just, I, I, I wasn't like, that, that's not the way I was designed. It wasn't how I thought. So that's, that's kind of, and so, so now, like at this stage of my life, I'm 47. Um, I still have a lot of hunger, you know, and, and, and I consider that a good thing. So. I want to make something of my own very successful. And I, I've had smaller successes. I've, I've, I've done these smaller startups in the past. A few of them were profitable, but never really scaled beyond a certain point. Um, and now I want to change that. And you know, I, I've also figured about more what I like to do. So I, I, I like doing these topics where it doesn't even feel like work. It's just something I'm passionate about. So if it, you know, with startups and stuff, the reality is like, it doesn't take off right away. So, but if, if you love it anyway, it doesn't feel like work and you're willing to just put in the time and the effort. So that, that's where I feel like I'm at in my life now. I see. There are things that you mentioned that are very interesting. And I could note that right now, uh, I mean, we pretty much are educated to set some target and go, go from A to B, zero to one. And now, as you are describing, you are now in a moment where you are actually enjoying the path in between that, instead of just rush for it. And uh, also, you mentioned that you would like to scale things because it did not actually get into that. When you talk about scale, successful business, as you had done before, Let's bring more numbers. You are talking, let's say, about that desirable billion. Well, I don't need to start a billion dollar company now, like on something that I found, right? I, I've been parts of companies that scaled where I was a member of the company. You know, I was in Groupon. I led Ukraine, and it was when Groupon really blasted off. And then I was in Lazada, you know, pre-IPO and. So I've been in these companies that are already fairly large and I was a member of them and I saw them become even larger. And that's like, I feel like that's good enough at that scale. The type of success I want, I'm happy, you know, just having a profitable business that does even just a few million, you know, in revenue. Like I, I, I'm more bootstrapping, like I'm not trying to VC raise or anything like this for what I'm doing. And I like these smaller sustainable businesses that you just enjoy doing. And I love the whole, I watch a lot of podcasts like My First Million and Greg Eisenberg and these type of things where it's, it's all about freedom. Mm-hmm. And I've had a couple bosses in my past that really had a negative mark on me, right? And Meaning like I've had some good bosses, but I've had a couple bosses where I was like, because of them, I don't want anyone to be able to call me their manager ever again. <laughs> That's like, it's like, I'm like, I, I think to myself, you know, like, it's like the Zuckerberg, like I'm my own fucking boss, you know, and I can dictate whatever I want. Like, I don't have to kiss anyone's ass. So that's, you know, I have clients, right? So you still have to kiss a little bit of ass, but I love that. And that is something that that's a freedom that I feel like I, you know, realized later on in life. I see. Um, Man, I totally understand what you're saying. And uh, I understand that now you are going in a direction, as you mentioned, that you have more freedom, you have more satisfaction. Uh, you do understand that 
out there there's a corporate world however it does not matter anything to you because you are exactly in the other way the other path you are actually getting things done and you're doing that well and is what matters for you instead of go on that uh model where we have hierarchy and we have a certain behavior that it's expected from you and of course there's out there a lot of people just giving you a very hard time sometimes for fun sometimes because you 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 deserve that but it's still really tough and uh, it does affect you as you mentioned right and uh, i would not i will not go into a negative direction here i would just say that uh, i would like to thank you to your bo bosses because they helped you become what you are today so you are moving away from that toxicity and that kind of traits that you already saw it didn't work yeah and what i realized in doing that you know when i play my game and my game is a very kind of structured organized non-political approach towards business like there's nobody that i know that plays that game better than me i just i'm wired for it i'm just like a very structured process oriented person and so I love feeling that, okay, I'm playing my game by my rules and, you know, nobody, you know, like, and, and I'm at the top of my game because it's by my own rules, which I are designed for my strengths. So I, that, that's like when you play something that way, it just makes you feel very good every day. You know, like you feel very satisfied. There's no like manager telling you, oh, okay, like you got to do this better. And like, like now when I think about my managers, like there's almost nobody that I'd think like, okay, like whatever it is we have to manage, like I will kick their ass now, but I'll manage it my way, which will be completely different from the old way, but I would slaughter them. Right. And that's like what I love now. It's like, is that I get to decide that, you know? I see, as you mentioned, everything comes all together and boils into your autonomy because, first of all, you are actually a specialist in what you're doing and uh, you are the one who knows best about that. When it comes to a corporate world, as we are talking, there are a lot of rules, there are risks, there are fears, there are things that, uh, let's say, they contaminate the initiatives and uh, sometimes or most of the time make people take very conservative uh, decisions while they are not even necessary in the first place. Just let people get the work done as they should. And now we have a very interesting example that is happening worldwide and we are watching here. Since uh, the outbreak of Corona in 2019, most of the companies, not all of course, because there are businesses that they depend on a face-to-face -face, uh, approach, but all the businesses that could run remotely, they did and they got astonishing numbers out of it. And of course, that thing not actually prove that we can do the work, it comes with some side effects. And one of them is that there is a whole industry from the time you wake up till the time you are in the office. We are talking about uh, real estate, we are talking about the food, we are talking about transport, we are talking about pretty much everything in between since you wake up. And this industry is under risk. And something interesting is happening because there are companies out there actually mandating and asking people to back to office, not only because of that, but also because of the way they would like to do things. And uh, what you think about this shift that is happening in few companies, because of course there are other companies out there that they are going to keep it remote. I think that whoever thinks that they need to go back to the office. So it's all, in my view, first of all, it's about having the right processes and systems. There are, you know, if you have the right process for remote, um, I think anyone can be very successful at remote, but a lot of people just don't have the right process. And when, when I hear about companies going back to the office, I, I studied economics in college, right? I was more or less an economics major. And at that time, and I graduated in 99, you know, it was all about like, you look at these curves, like 
China had a you know GDP per capita of like five thousand or less, and America at the time had like thirty five thousand. And manufacturing at that time had has was moving very quickly to China. So, basically, manufacturing of the last twenty thirty years has like dried up around the world and more or less moved to China and a few other Asian countries and whatnot. And everybody accepted that, right? Like entire industries closed. And that, that is because of arbitrage, global arbitrage. Like it was cheaper. Chinese labor was cheaper. They were good, blah, blah, blah. And now I see a different arbitrage happening. I see white collar arbitrage. So what, one thing that Taspies does, and we're a very small scale level, but I see much bigger companies than, than us, is we're taking all the white collar jobs by middle management, lower management in the US and in Europe. And you know, we're we're doing the same thing with people in Pakistan and Philippines at one fifth to one tenth the cost. And these people are similarly educated and they're often even like better workers than the Americans. Right? So and the reason we can do that is because you know they're working remote. Right? Like you cannot work in person if you're an American company with a guy in Pakistan. So I think these companies that are trying to get back to the office, like they're just forgetting about macroeconomics. Like global arbitrage will dictate that they will need to use people around the world that are much cheaper and better specialists for that specific thing. And if they do not do that, then some company that does do that will eventually beat them, right? And that is what we saw in manufacturing already. So, you know, and certain companies have a pretty big moat. Like I saw that Amazon is getting back to the office. So like, you're not going to see Amazon, you know, get their butts kicked too quickly. But for companies that don't have a very big moat and they just say, okay, we're going to do everything from the office. And, you know, they're paying like American middle managers, wait, you know, salaries of seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 when they could be using someone in Pakistan and paying the $5,000. they are not going to make it. So, yeah, that's how I look at it. It's like remotes going to win by a landslide because that's economics. Yeah. Yes, uh, I think explain explain very well what we are actually seeing for nearly three years already in a row is uh, is something very very different of anything else. Is actually uh, unprecedented. But it's so the industrial revolutions that we passed through, all of them, of course, have been uh, unique in, in a certain way. And we are passing through another one that maybe is way faster. And uh, how have your dreams evolved and your goals as well over the years? So I would say my definition of happiness and my what I'm satisfied with has evolved. When I was young, I was much more money driven. And I thought about money much more than I do now. And now my goals are more around what do I enjoy doing? Like what legacy do I want to leave? These are, you know, these are still you know, like the prime years of my life. How do I want to spend them? So that's more how I look at my goals. Like, am I doing things I'm passionate about? Am I trying to leave a mark that I will be proud of when I'm, you know, really old and reflecting on my life? So I'd say that's what drives me more and less about my title or how much I earn. Like I am at heart a backpacker and a very simple guy. And I worked in big companies for a long time and I saved. So it's, you know, while, while I kind of shit on that early part of my life, like it gave me some cushion to be flexible now. And yeah, now, like, I feel like I look at things very differently and partially because that cushion enables me to. I understand what you say. You think that that time when we was forced to stop what we was doing, 
because we was of course in a frenzy, everyone working really a lot. Uh, I recently um, traveled during the summer break to Brazil and was the first time my family saw my daughter face to face and it took six years to do that because like everyone else, I was out there working my ass off every single day and make things happen. You think that once we start to have a little bit of time, and of course it comes also with uh, Corona and all of that, that things that, that changes, right? That very fast changes that happen in our day-to-day -day life. You think it did help you to stop for a while and reflect about where you are heading towards, reflect as well about all of the effort and things that you have been doing and sometimes in things that you do not believe, you do not enjoy, and you, you maybe made a change based on that, or you think that was something that have been coming and evolving with you through how your your whole life? No, I think COVID and the change, I had some other things happen in my life around that same time with my health and stuff. So the combination of those things, but with COVID and the fact that I had to work remote, and that because of my health, like I began contracting and working for myself, not as a side thing, but as a full-time thing. So it's the combination of these things that I really realized, oh, wow, like this, what I'm doing, and I thought it's just a plan B is actually a great, like it's the plan A I was always looking for. And, you know, I would have hated to just work for managers that I didn't want to work for for another 10, 20 years. And that's, I think, something that like COVID and all that, and, you know, kind of like pushed it on me uh, and, and ended up being a very good thing. I see. I like what you say. As, as uh, we mentioned in, in other episodes, you did not waste a good crisis. You made the needed changes and also you, you look at yourself and also you saw what you would like to do, which is very interesting. So thank you for that. And as you have been mentioning, autonomy, satisfaction, freedom. What does freedom mean to you? And how do you feel free? So freedom to me means that people can ask me what to do but they cannot tell me what to do, right? And I've worked, like I've seen larger companies and, and I have family members where like they're pushed into these really uncomfortable situations, but like they know that there's no good plan B. You know, they work in a big company. They don't like the way their boss treats them, but they've got mortgage and blah, blah, blah. And like, they just got to like suck it up and be that person that they need to be to survive or to continue. And for me, freedom means like, I'm never going to be that person. Like, if someone says something that I don't like, like, I'm just going to tell them off. And like, I don't care. Like, I have other clients and I have other things I can do. And I don't care about money that much. And I'm just going to be that person. Like, I'm going to be the person that like, if you're working with me, and you treat other people that way, you're going to know very quickly that like, that don't work with me. Cause I'm just going to tell you to like, like, you know, whatever. So that's for me, freedom is that, is that I love working with people and I like having clients and I, I understand the responsibility of getting things done well, but you know, I'm, I'm going to do it a little bit my own way and whoever's working with me is going to understand that they're going to have to like treat me very respectfully and and not like they're telling me that i have to do it their way understood this reminds me of something very important that we learn and is also about high performance which you are clearly one of those persons uh, as I understand the high performance teams that I have been working for over 10 years and I'm also specialized in and have built many across my years of career, it's very important for those teams when you say what to do. However, how to do 
is what they are going to decide, define, and bring the solution because you just stay out of the way and let them do the job. They are professional, they are the specialists, not you. And uh, we understand there's a lot of uh, unsecured persons there, and also they carry a burden, and uh, they are also into this very heavy structure where they have to, as you mentioned, right? These people have not only mortgage, but they have very, very serious responsibilities, and absolutely they are afraid to, to lose on something that we're going to impact in a negative way the families or the way of life. And as we are seeing here, clearly you are in a moment of your life and your career that you have built all of this backbone. And now you can work in a better way that brings not only satisfaction for yourself, but also for your customers, because you are clearly doing a way better work than you ever be if it was under anyone else. And it, it is the same for the teams and the, the contractors which you organize across a project, across, across an initiative. Yeah, I think so. I like, I find that my system is very good for the people that are a bit more introverts and they were not good at politics. And I feel like the traditional office based culture lends to a certain type of leader who is a good communicator and manages up well. And I offer a different approach where I'm not going to try to get to know you. You don't need to get to know the rest of your team. There is no popularity contest. Like we're going to be very clear about what needs to get done and you'll have the flexibility to, to, turn, to do it your own way. But like we also, you know, we we'll want you to be very transparent about how you work. And that's the only thing we ask for. And I see that as the future that I would have wanted 20 years ago. And when, when you see the future through that lens, like the way that I work, who the good leaders are look very different from what you typically see in large organizations. And so I've, I've been living and working through this lens for four years. And so like, when I look at traditional leaders that might even like have a, an ego that they're blah, blah, blah. And when I, when, you know, and sometimes like I see these type of folks and I just look at them as like, I look at them with from a very different lens already. And, and I think I'm kind of, I'm ahead of the pack. Like, I think the whole world is going to work a bit more like the way I work in the next 10, 20 years and realize that like a lot of our concepts of management and what leaders should act like are a lot, very wasteful, you know, like that's, that's what I've realized in the way that I work is just how well this way of working can work and people will be happy with it. Like I have never had people that are as satisfied working with me as I have had the last four years by not trying to get to know them. Okay, I got it. And uh, just to bring a bit more of context to the persons who are listening to us, the point is, in a corporate uh, world, there is things like career, bonus, hierarchy, reputation. There are a lot in play that happens into the office. And uh, you can just embody everything into politics. I'm not talking if it's harmful or not. I'm just describing plain and clear. And as we have been seeing happening to the world in the last three years where we are having layoffs, disregard of your performance, of what you have given or taken, disregard anything, this pretty much seems to be the future as Ken is mentioning because you know you don't need to do all of that effort and all of that sacrifice if you already know there's no career plan for you. And uh, the companies are showing clearly that they did not have a career plan for you because a lot of careers have been stopped abruptly right away. And uh, they may not come back because we also have a revolution happening right now. It's related to AI, to technology, and to other ways of doing things. That's why I truly believe and understand that the way that you found to move ahead is really the future. And yes, most probably what you are saying, people in 10 years ahead will listen to the same and understand, yes. This guy had a vision, he saw how things were going to be in the future, because if you already do not have a career or progress, 
or any kind of plan owned by someone else instead of you, in this case, the corporations, then you better just get the work done, do it well, be no for this and move to the next one instead of even get to know each other because it won't change a thing. I'm not saying you cannot have a career and you know, when a company is doing well, it is good to have a career and whatnot, but I do not think having a career is synonymous, having a good career is synonymous with getting to know everybody. These are assumptions that we've held for a long time, which I have challenged the last four years. And like, if I were managing a, a company of a couple hundred people today, I would manage it exactly the way I manage things now. And I think people would love it, but they would have a career, right? Like I'd still want to offer them stability and get them to grow and whatnot. But I wouldn't like, I wouldn't want politics. I wouldn't want like people teaming up and, you know, cause that's human nature. And I've seen that over and over again. So, um, you know, I, I hope that there's still room for careers, and, you know, some stability for people when they want it. But um, I, I, I think it, that can work with what I'm saying too. Understand. So thanks for bringing me more clarity over this. Uh, so it's possible the career, there are things that still can be fulfilled. Um, however, that's it, right? It's clear enough now. So thank you, Ken. I think this is really interesting. And um, this goes exactly in a direction that uh, I think you are consciously planning, right? Because it's about your legacy as well. And this is how do you would like to be remembered? So I think there's a couple of concepts that I've come upon because of my life and maybe my style that I think are unique and that I think have a chance to grow, right? This way of working where everything is a task in a management system and everybody's responding very quickly to these notifications they get and I use ClickUp. That is one where like, I've just seen that I think it's transformative. And if, if I can have an influence in companies that I somehow interact with, seeing that vision and working differently and therefore, you know, people that enjoy that system enjoy working even more and feel like it's a fair place. I would love to, for that to be part of my legacy. So that that's something where like, I feel like I had a very, you know, I work pretty different from most people. Um, and I'm very proud of what I've learned and I, I've tested on different companies and I'm pretty sure that it can be applied to most companies. So that's one legacy. And then my other legacy is this health stuff that I, you know, was struggling with for 10 years, which I think could become massive on a level that makes, that would be on the level of competing with AI, right? And, and people think I'm crazy, but I'm telling you in like 30, 40 years, people will not think I'm crazy. Cause I, I've always been like, you know, I have a feel for things and uh, yeah. So these two elements are like what I consider the legacy I want to leave, leave. I understand. So you have a uh, feeling guts and that is something important to listen to. And uh, this is a very, very interesting and also I uh, would say very um, uncertain path, which we have in the future. We are not sure because we do not have enough information. First, AI is here clearly to replace workers. Yes or no, we do not know. Second, AI is here to enhance and make us be able to do way more than we are capable to do because it will cut corners. I will put like that. Or the third, the third is where instead of cut jobs and be something helpful, will be something that maybe will be a waste because we are not there yet. For example, if you try to do your work today, you can even 
take all of your tasks in a single day and try to work with AI, at least when I do that, I, I perceive that uh, part of the work that have been doing somehow is degraded. Somehow doesn't make much sense or is going to a strange direction. There's no cognition in there. So I need to step into it to do something. So right now I understand that they have to work well, need to be full integrated, which we do not have this. We do not have full integrations between systems because also this is a huge talk and major risk when we're talking about cybersecurity. Yeah. So which of the three ways you, you, you feel that we may go or not? Because absolutely we do not know. So it's just a guess is a, I would say is a very humble and respectful question if you if you would like to answer so i think i think we're at a friction point in terms of over longer periods of time the world adjusts really well to whatever the trend is and over short periods people get squeezed and i think we're in a generation where you know a, a fair number of people are going to get squeezed. AI, you know, companies are more efficient, and there just isn't the need for as much skilled labor in certain industries as there was. But the thing is, is like, you know, depopulation is occurring, and AI is going to open up different types of opportunities, and and you know, and a lot of these global arbitrage our opportunities are starting to go away as, you know, a person in China earns a lot more now than they did 20 years ago in many other parts of the world. So like the value, yeah, I would say like the, the biggest destruction of American jobs has not been in AI. It's very clearly been overseas labor and that is starting to go away because it's starting to equalize more and more. So I'm just in this thing where I like, I think, you know, AI will do its thing. People will get more efficient this generation will get squeezed but in a generation or two like everything's going to work out you know and, and people are going to make a fair income and live a decent life uh and we're going to you know we're going to have ai as a an important part of our of our balance again which event uh in your career that uh you feel that has most shaped uh your professional identity today? So, I would say when I joined Lazada, I actually joined as a commercial person. And I was supposed to be an SVP of Marketplace under Alex Darty in the Vietnam organization. And at the time, I had a big health issue. Uh, which would, you know, mark my next 10 years a lot. And it was related to this dental stuff. Basically, a dentist had drilled my back teeth and I, I couldn't retain information. And it was very scary. Like, I worked and it was my first month on the job. I had a pregnant wife. We just moved from Ukraine, which was in war, to Vietnam. And we had our first son on the way and my wife had never lived outside of Ukraine. And then I was working for Alex study. He was a very tough guy and I couldn't think like, it's not just that I couldn't think like I couldn't sleep. I couldn't, I couldn't function after, you know, a month or so. So I didn't know what to do because we didn't really have any support network. You know, I think, I just felt like I was a dumbass every day uh, and I wasn't sure what to do. So, and if like, if we couldn't, if I couldn't do the job, I would have to move somewhere. And I didn't even know where, right? Like we couldn't really go back to Ukraine. I hadn't really lived in the US for 15 to 20 years. So I, I was like at a loss of what to do. I came up with an idea that I would just try to do something that would allow me to chill out. And that is where I came up with the idea that maybe, and, and also they, they had kind of like asked me if I wanted to do it, but like they said, hey, why don't you try product? And I talked with Sohil and luckily there was a position in Vietnam that I could do. 
right? And and so that inflection point in my career was a very important one because first I I voluntarily demoted myself two levels. I went from an SVP of marketplace to a senior PM managing nobody. Uh, and it was like, it was a big hit to my pride, but I was in survival mode. Like I, I literally, if someone told me something, if I didn't type it, it was out of my head. So it forced me to be very structured. Like I was a pretty structured person before that. But like when you don't retain information at all in your head for a period of three to six months, which is the you know the condition I was in in middle of 2014, it turns you into Superman of structure <laughs> because I couldn't even like if I was on a call, if I didn't write it out bullets before, if I just try to wing it and think of what to say, like my bl- my head was blank. And I would have these group calls that I have to do you know, with different countries and regional calls and stuff like this. And so it, it made me re-evaluate how I work and become this process structure person. And it, it taught me an empathy that I would never forget because I was always like in high school, I was at the top of my class. I was the only person to go into an Ivy. I worked in consulting and I was always a good performer. And then all of a sudden I was dumbass. <laughs> and that was like a new thing for me. You know, like I was doing a job at senior PM where most of the other people were 10 years younger than me. I was, you know, 38 and they were mid to late twenties. And not only that, but like, you know, like I was horrible because I couldn't think. So it taught me this empathy. It taught me structure. It taught me what they do on the tech side of the house and tech became more or less my focus for the next 10 years. And even now, you know, tech is a big part of my focus. And um, so th- that, that I think is probably the biggest inflection point uh, in my life. And, and all those health things that were happening were also like that, that would have a big impact on me in the next 10 years. I see it was very profound because as you explained it, you was moving away from a different country. You was also doing a exit from the previous company that was working for, and it was of course the, if I'm not mistaken, the CEO of that company. Uh, you had also a lot of pressure and also uh, your first child was coming. And uh, it is really a lot in, in a very short span of time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was so I was CEO of Groupon, but I had left because I was asked to sh- help shut down Groupon because it was losing some money and the war had started. And Groupon was an IPO company, so like I had already left Groupon, and Groupon had been shut down, but. I, I was helping in like a VC fund for a little while, but moving back to Ukraine just wasn't an option. Like the country, you know, Kiev at that time, like there was like fighting on the streets and stuff and the economy was tanking. So yeah, there was a lot like, it was not just family moving to a new country, moving to a new type of job, moving, not having any support network. Like I was a pretty tough guy by that point in my life because I'd lived in many places. And if it wasn't for that, I would have fallen apart. You know, like my wife, she needed, even though I was falling apart, like she needed my support. Like she was not the type of person at that point in her life that could offer me much support because she was, you know, living with her parents before that and stuff. So it was like a perfect storm. But it taught me that I could survive a perfect storm. And now, like, like you'd have to come at me with everything to, like, even damage me. You know, that's the way I feel after that. When you live six months and you hold out on a job in the state where, like, if you told me something, it was out of my head in five minutes. Like, you try, like, when, when a person thinks about what that means for six months, like, it devastates you. Yeah. Yes, I understand. I passed for something similar, not about the Blink. The Blink was actually in a previous company. Uh, I, you know, I burned too much of the midnight oil 
of course, my, my mistake, my responsibility today, I recognize that. And I do not feel proud of being working there 32 hours nonstop. This is just unnecessary and risky for your career and for you. And uh, those blanks at least happened to me. Uh, by the time I was single, so it was not much of a problem because it was pretty much just managed to find another job, try a new kind of environment. And of course, an environment that uh, absolutely recognizes the work you do and the effort that you put into things instead of an environment which you give you everything and you do not have nothing coming back from it. So this is, this is the environment which I came from before I, I met you as well and we work together. And uh, the same as you, I have been moving around, not, not just like you, of course, you was way more radical than me because you went to Japan which has a very different culture, structure, everything there is really amazing, interesting. And uh, then you move it to Ukraine. And uh, from Ukraine, you move it uh, later on to, to Asia again. In this case, it was Vietnam. Yeah, and I was also in between. From Japan, I moved to Spain. I lived in Spain for a year and a half. I lived in France for six months. I lived in London for a year and a half. Then I moved to Ukraine. Then I moved to Moscow. No, no, sorry. After London, I moved to Moscow. I lived in Moscow for four years. And then I moved to Ukraine. And then from Ukraine, I moved to Vietnam. Yes, you very, you have a very, very uh, strong backbone. However, it was exactly that point, as you mentioned before. Uh, before, it was pretty much solo. But uh, once you was living in Ukraine, was already with a family and, uh, let's say, more important problems, more important things to solve and to handle it. And uh, it was by your own, which you have been for long. Wasn't, wasn't that the matter, was other things that you was passing through. Thank you. Uh, it's interesting what you said. Uh, I see that uh, maybe now a lot of people is passing through this, where they need to just wrap up their lives and, and go somewhere else. And there's a high level of uncertainty. And you cope with that. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, I had a lot of practice on that, you know, moving to a new place, not knowing people. That was the easy part. But it was like, the real perfect storm was having this kind of tough boss, like people that had worked for Alex Darty, and he was under a lot of pressure in 2014. So here I was, this guy who didn't know, he didn't know, who couldn't think and was in this country with a wife that he convinced to come over. And she was more of like just this sheltered family person to that point. And she was pregnant. You know, like when you put all those things together, it was just a ton of stress. And I couldn't sleep at night. And I, I turned into like a hermit because of the medical health things that were happening to me. So I tell this story like I was so rocked health wise that the tech floor in Lazada was above the local floor in the old Copac building. And there was a little nap room. And because I wouldn't be able to sleep much at night, and I would just feel frozen and scared during the day because of everything my body was going through. And I had this like, I, I would say I had a mild neurological disease. I would just hide. Like, I couldn't like, because I, I sat right across from Darty, and I was feeling awful. And, uh, you know, I would just, like, go to that room when I would, you know, I'd have these, like, mini panic attacks. And I would just go hide. And then when I moved to tech, then it chilled out. But I would still have these panic attacks because my health was going crazy. And I would hide in the dirty-ass toilet. And I would sit on the bowl pretending I was going to go to the bathroom <laughs> for like 20 minutes because that was the only way of like preventing a, a panic attack because if I was out. So like I had these massive medical issues that like I figured out later, luckily. But, you know, when you go through that every day, like it's scary. Yes, and I remember something very important that... Uh... I would say before 2019, before 2019, I would say that we had no awareness, we have no knowledge, we have no empathy for such things that is happening 
quite often, way before that, as you mentioned, because not only the high pressure that you have, but also the uncertainty and things that happen in your life, which you have no control over it, which does affect you. And by the time, absolutely, there is no, no support, no net support, nothing related to that, and you need to figure out your own way. Today is a bit better because, again, since the event of 2019, we start to not only recognize, but also go into a direction that we have support for such things. Not only uh, panic, but also anxiety and, and other, other issues that it may happen to you during your day, you know, during the things that you are passing through. So what, what you faced was extremely challenging. And I'm proud that uh, you are here today. You have a really nice story telling about what happened and how did you cope with it. This is really good and meaningful. Thank you. And this is, this comes to my legacy and the health stuff. But I realized that there is a there was a physical root cause to all of that, right? And so I had I understood, I figured out later in later years what that physical root cause was, and now I I'm I fixed it and I like, I'm still, but like, that is the other interesting thing about it is that I experienced something like that several times in the following years as I was figuring out this medical stuff and I put together this connection between the physical and the mental health, which I think is, you know, the other part of my legacy that I want to leave is I, I, you know, a side business that I have is, is, is utilizing this learning as well. This is where it comes, not only the group, but the, I forgot, I'm, I'm not sure, please correct me about the, de the dental and posture. Could you please let us know more about that? Yeah, so it's a very deep topic, but let's just say that there's your skull and that your teeth provide a very important structural support that modern medicine doesn't understand in that between your skull and your jaw the only thing that prevents your jaw from fully closing like to the to the roof of your mouth is your teeth right like regardless of how much you grind your teeth like your teeth will always make contact and it turns out that these teeth uh, play an important biomechanical role and that if you grind down your teeth or something like this, and you're, like your skull actually kind of deflates and crushes your brain. And that's what I was experiencing. Like, this is my interpretation of it. And I've now spent, you know, over 10, 10 years since that time, like studying and testing and experimenting on myself, but that is how I interpret it. And therefore, like when your skull crushes your brain because of this you have neurological and cognitive issues which you can but but the good thing is it's like a biomechanical thing and so you can reverse it and that is what i'm doing and that's what i find amazing about it like it what was the worst nightmare that i wouldn't wish on my worst enemy in 2014 will become my biggest asset of my entire life um because I've figured out how it works and I think it's going to help me live a very healthy life uh, as a result and, and help others as well. This is very important and uh, interesting as well. I put all together because uh, you, you transfer your weakness. Of course, you learn, you copy for it, you dealt with it and you turn this into into your extreme, and uh, yeah. and this is is very important because again, I, I feel you. I have been there, of course, in different situations, in different things, and uh, I I get to learn and move along in life and learning exactly that. What do you fear? Is exactly what you may need to work better and uh, find ways and combine to make it something stronger, something that you feel proud of something that it also may bring a legacy to you instead of, you know, just uh, surrender to, to the fear or to that uh, feelings that you are having over it, that they, they are not positive, they are negative. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And uh, how do you define leadership and what makes a good leader in your view? 
So I've simplified my view on leadership a lot because of the way that I work. And so I view it as setting some simple goals based on your strategy, right? And these can change and whatnot, but like, and then, and then managing a process uh, that is very transparent to execute on it, right? So like the way that I do it with my systems is we set up all these tasks and they're organized into folders and spaces on ClickUp. And then they're assigned to people and people can create their own tasks and they manage the status and they do updates. So my job as a leader is just to align on a strategy with them, make sure that there's a system for clearly breaking that strategy down into tasks and then main, making sure that the process runs smoothly to that all these people execute these tasks. And that is basically for me the extent. Like I don't, I don't try to invest in culture. Like I don't even talk about culture. Like if anyone asks me about culture, like there's no culture. And yet everyone's going to be happy, you know. And like I'm going to try and be fair and transparent. And there's going to be not really any politics because people aren't going to really know each other, right? And like all these people that are writing massive books about leadership, like I just think it's you know like when you work the way I do. First of all, I think I'll beat them. In that what if we have the same goal like they're gonna have a tough time beating me just because i'm so efficient with whatever resources i have and i'm not going to invest almost any time in quote-unquote leadership like i'm not going to give a shit about leadership i'm just gonna like do this very simple thing <laughs> <laughs> i think leadership everyone has their own style you know this happens to be the way that i do it and uh, I try to keep it very simple and um, understood. Uh, Ken, you have uh, any final thoughts? Like I have these worldviews now, right? And, and so the businesses, the two main business I have fall into those worldviews. And one worldview that I've seen is I've worked with a lot of freelancers. So in the last four years, my teams are mainly freelancers. Some of them I've had on Upwork, Fiverr, and I pay them for what they do. And sometimes I pay them for time. Sometimes I pay them for a scope. But, you know, I've been able to numerous times between my side hustles or clients, like I throw together a team in a day or two, right? Like coded apps, not no code apps, sales teams, marketing things, BI tools. Like I'll put together a team in one or two days and they'll be decent. And like, I, I use vetted people. And if I don't have vetted people, I try two or three people out on the same task. And within a week I have a good one. So I use these systems, which I think are like, they're so much faster and so much better than what other people do in my view that there is no way that the future doesn't consist of this being a much bigger thing because so many good people are freelancing now and that's kind of the foundation is that so many people are unemployed willing to freelance and so if you know how to find them make sure that they're decent put them into a process that is very clear and easy for them to work remotely like you know forget like any company run the traditional way where they're going to like spend three months recruiting someone. And then like a lot of times when I work with clients, you know, I have my contracting team and I work with their team and I would consider, I would consider like on average clients I work with, like their employees are maybe by my definition, 30% utilized. Right. Cause if they, if, I, if they're working in my system, I'd have transparency on everything they do. And I'd know relatively what they did the entire day. And I'd like, no, okay. That took that person two hours. Like we're paying that person for eight hours and it took them two hours. And it's not like that with everyone, but like, that's generally what I see. So what I do with my task beasts is I'm playing for this future where we can throw together pretty good teams and I call them B players. I'm not trying to get a players. A players, like, sometimes they're just great. Sometimes they have a lot of baggage. Sometimes they, like, jump companies a lot. Like, I'm going for good B players who are reliable, you know, whatnot, used to my process. 
And then, you know, basically anything that a company does, I can put together this vetted team of B players who are already accustomed to the process. And the process essentially makes it work like it is as reliable as employees, if not more, because it's so transparent. They know how to work. So what I want to do is work with founders and early stage companies and train them that they don't need employees almost at all in the early days. Like, do not hire an employee until you have some kind of product market fit validating that that job is needed. Because if you hire someone, right, and then it turns out not to work, which happens a lot, um, then you're going to have to fire that person, right? And you may have taken that person from a job that they enjoyed, right? And so, like, there's just so much inefficiency in how these companies typically work where they're based on employees and I will find someone. It, it, it's not only that I'll find them faster and it'll be cheaper and they'll be much more transparent. Like they will even be as good, right? Like people don't understand when you, when you're hiring an employee uh, versus testing three different freelancers to choose the best one, like statistically, I will have a much better shot of getting a better person than you interviewing, you know, for three months, but not working with the person, right? I will have spent one week working with three or four people to choose one. And I would put money down that my one that I chose after one week will be better than the person that you chose based on three, basic, three months of interviewing more than 50% of the time. And that's just through experience. Like I, I hired p people through interviews for 20 years and I saw the mistakes and, you know, and, and then I realized, well, you work with the person for a week or two and you have them follow a process that is very transparent. You will know what they're like, what you're getting. So yeah, this is task piece. This is the future that I see is you're throwing together teams quick. You're validating things and you're only hiring employees when you know that it works. Um, and we want to just, we want to be like the, and, and I, we provide what, what I call a chief operating, chief outsourcing officer, which is either me or my partner. So it's a temporary fractional role where we act almost as like, uh, almost like a COO for these freelancers. So, you know, for the CEO, who the founders are, they tell us what they need to get done. We go, we staff it. And we manage that process for them. So it's like, it's not just like we, like a staffing agency, like we give you a bunch of people and it, it's up to you. Like we actually manage them and manage the process and we, you know, answer for the results. So in that way, we consider ourselves like a fractional manager of the company because we're not just like staffing people, we're actually managing them. So yeah, that's that's the vision with Task Beast, and you know we've got a couple clients, and it's fun. You know, like I, I think it's it's a new mindset for a lot of people. So the way that I do onboarding usually is that there's a set of tasks that I just copy and paste for every new employee, and I you know, and then I assign them those tasks, and they do their own onboarding, and it has some documents they should read, but. What I've also learned is that when you work in a system that is not based on relationships and everything is a task and those tasks are structured into a very organized logical tree, there isn't that much you need to onboard them on, right? Like you think about what onboarding typically consists of in a traditional company, like, oh, you got to get to know that person. You got to get to know that person. You got to figure out how that works. And oh, by the way, how that works isn't documented anywhere. There is none of that shit. Like it's literally like, here's your Kanban board. You can click through the task and see everything that we're doing and who's doing what. And when you read through that shit, like you literally know everything we're doing because there's no like relationships you need to worry about or anything. 